Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. My quest has always been to help us to uh, establish a relationship with God and how to have fellowship with God. And this morning, waiting on God is a big topic that we seem to fail a lot in. I know I have in the past all the time. Uh, And in my reading, it's really neat. It amazes me continually how reading through the Bible, you read something, and then one day you read that same thing uh, another time, and it just jumps out at you. And uh, and that's what happened with this several months ago. And uh, we're going to look at Israel right now and uh, a situation that happened to them. Israel has been down in Egypt for some time now. And jo- remember Joseph, uh, at, when he died, at the end of, of the chapter in the Bible, the next uh, chapter or book, is it, it's been so long I forgot now, says and uh, a king r- r- came up in Egypt that did not know of Joseph. And, all. and that's where we're taking place here. Uh, there's a new king that knew nothing about Israel and them coming down, and they a- ended up becoming slaves. And they were building the, all some of these great buildings of its day. And now Moses, God sends Moses uh, to come back to lead the God's people back out of Egypt. And just before they are ready to leave, the last plague is about to come down on it. And they had ten plagues. The last plague is where they're going to, the firstborn of animals and children are going to die. And there's some interesting things happens just before this when he speaks to the people. So in uh, Exodus chapter 11 verse 2, God speaking to Moses and says this, Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow from his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold and the lord gave the people favor in the sight of the egyptians moreover the man moses was very great in the land of egypt in the sight of pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people this is really an interesting thing that occurs here it really caught my eye, and I prayed about it and, and finally put this together. But one of the problems we have in life is waiting on God sometimes. We pray and pray, and we kind of give up. We, we, it should have been answered by now, you know. And here the children of Israel have been in Egypt for quite a few years at this point. And they've been praying to God, asking for deliverance, and nothing's been happening. And one of the problems is in our lives is waiting on God. And Israel is no different. They were at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, They couldn't get any lower in their life, uh, what they were doing, making those bricks and all that stuff. And and if you ever watched Charleston Heston and play Moses at that time, uh, even though it was totally not doctrinally sound, but it still played a a lot there was was true. And uh, Moses comes along and he starts doing these miracles. And what happens? After a couple miracles, Pharaoh gets mad and increases the burden on the children of Israel. And the children of Israel say, Moses, get away. You're nothing but problems. And yet he's in the will of God. The children of Israel are not. They're tired of waiting. And uh, leave us alone because you're making things worse for us. And we seem to have the same problem. You know, we seem to be down about things that happen to us in our lives, whether it's work or home or family or whatever. And we start praying, and what's the first thing we do after a period of time? Whether it's a week, couple weeks, maybe it's six months or whatever. And, uh, and we get tired, and the next thing we do, we try to figure out the problems ourselves rather than keep looking to God. And just like Israel, we want to do it our way. And that's what happens. Israel wants to do it way. Leave us alone. Let us do it our way. At least the burden wasn't as great. We don't take the time to really wait on the Lord. And neither did Israel. And if you think about it, one of my favorite verses is Philippians 4.19. 
It says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You've heard of the verse that says, God owns the cattle of a thousand hills, on a thousand hills. One of the things is, he's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the maker of everything. Uh, the one thing I like to know is where God was when he stepped into whatever <laughs> and made the universe and all. That's just something I'm curious about. It just doesn't tell us. But God will supply the needs according to the glory of Jesus. Everything that happens in our life, everything that's good when God blesses, brings glory to Christ. And that's what this verse means. But it says that he'll supply all, not a couple, not some of them, but all our needs. But the problem is we simply don't wait. Remember George Mueller I mentioned a couple weeks ago? I talked to him about him. Everything he did, he prayed. But the difference between him and us most of the time is when he got up and God didn't answer the prayer yet, he went back and prayed some more. And he keep praying and praying all the way up to the deadline. He was a true prayer warrior. And God would answer those prayers maybe one minute before the deadline, 30 seconds before the deadline. It was really it. But he learned how to wait on God. God had been testing Israel for many years. He heard their cry, but was waiting for the right moment to do things. And waiting for their faith to trust in him fully. Because even if you think about the 40 years during the wilderness, what was the problem? We need this now. We need, and I'm going to mention one of the verses that they uh, mentioned about being in there in just a minute. They just had a problem not wanting to wait on God. And every time it got them in trouble. Waiting for their faith to grow is what God was looking for. Now, God could have had Pharaoh, think about this, go after the first plague. But if you remember, God kept hardening Pharaoh's heart. But it was for a reason. God, There was a reason for all those plagues. And I'm going to, well, I'll mention it to you here in just a moment. But the things were not in the right place yet. And that was one of the reasons. Pharaoh had not seen God work to believe in God. God. And if you know the Pharaohs of those days, Pharaoh was supposed to be a God in himself, whoever it was Pharaoh. So he was just another God. The Egyptians also had to see God work to believe. Because if the, our theme verse, what were they doing? The people were glad to give them the gold and the silver. Just get out of the country. We don't want to see any more plagues. And above all, Israel had to see God work and believe. And that was some of the reasons for all those plagues. Again, we have the same problem. We must learn to wait on God. And we have a tendency, oh, well, I've waited. But we don't wait until God moves. That's our problem sometimes. Now, sometimes God answers our prayer pretty quick. And we waited all through that. But what about the ones that we've been worrying about and praying for years and nothing's happened? God knows when to do things. I want you to think about this. This really hit me. I had a meeting with Geneva's oldest son. How many here remember Geneva Anderson? I, I know some of you do. Okay, she died, you know, about six months ago. And uh, I went and talked to her son because he had mentioned on the phone when I called him up, told him I couldn't make the, the funeral and all. And uh, uh, we had a good talk. He's he's a uh, works in the bank, and uh, what was interesting is he said, "By the way, Glenn, my wife has cancer." I went, "Really? You know, your mom just died of it, and she had cancer, a tumor in the brain." And remember, we've been praying about Wendy. Remember, and she died. She had to. And what's really interesting is, and I didn't tell him this about Wendy, but every symptom that Wendy had. She, his wife has and what's interesting is that they went in and did surgery too in the brain you know cut it open took the, the tumor out and all that they could and she's going through therapy but guess what with her it's going away Wendy it didn't she died and God knew about that and yet we have another person with the same thing both Christians and here's one that looks like it's going to be cured we don't know waiting on God. We don't know the answer, just like uh, Al's wife. I mean, he did everything they could. 
and yet she died. Geneva ended up living 12 more years after she got cancer. We don't understand God, but the key is waiting on God. That's the key. Now, let's face it. It takes, we got to have faith to wait on God. We, we really do, because it can, I guess, get a little frustrating. When are you going to answer this prayer? I, I feel like I have to have it now. I need it now, whatever it is. Maybe it's a problem with our physically, or maybe financial problem, or maybe our kids, or, or whatever in our family. But here's the interesting thing I want us to look at. Now I'm going to look at what God does with Israel at the time of this uh, theme verse. God tells Israel to go and borrow jewels and silver of gold, uh, jewels of silver and gold. The word borrow, when you first read it, think about this. If you borrow something, it's like you're going to pay it back. But the word translate in the Hebrew means this. This is interesting, collecting back wages. Now think about that a moment. Israel is a slave for all those years. They didn't get paid anything. I mean, they got the food and all, but they were slaves working hard every day. Not really. I mean, it wasn't a job anybody wanted to do. And they're getting paid for all that time. And when they left, they left with a lot of money. And the Egyptians couldn't wait to give it to them. To get, just get out of our country. Get away. We don't want no more plagues again. Israel had to work all those years, and now it's payback time. And by the way, I did when I did some research, they said that money actually carried them through all that 40 years. They apparently had an enormous amount of money. And uh, the Egyptians gave it to them. Israel is now getting all they needed to leave and take care of business, and God did it in his timetable. But you wouldn't have, if you'd have asked them before all that happened, before Moses got there, they, they, they thought that nothing was ever going to happen. If they had learned their lesson earlier, it would be interesting, would, that have, would they have went through all that? I would think not. Just as far as we could say Adam and Eve didn't take that apple. You, I don't know if you ever think about this or not. How many trees were in the Garden of Eden that were special? Two. What was one? Tree of life. Okay, what was the other one? Tree of knowledge. Well, tree of good and evil. Yeah, eat good and evil. What if they would have ate the tree of life? What would have happened? We wouldn't be doing what we're doing right now. The Garden of Eden still be there and we'd be living in there and have eternal life. Now we're eventually going to get at the end what we should have got at the beginning had they, and that's why they were kicked out and the angel guarded the Eden because they, it says they had to keep them away from eating that because if they ate that apple after the sin they would have lived forever in a sin state and by the way that tree is going to be in the future it's going to come back we get to eat off of it we need to learn. And, we, and here's the thing, I think, what lesson we have to learn for us today. We have a tendency that we wait on God for a while. And if it doesn't turn out as fast as we would like, you know what we do? We try to fix things ourselves. And sometimes you do. Sometimes we go out there and we do something and try to accomplish a good thing, but we do it the wrong way. We're not in God's will doing it. Once we... One thing we must learn is that God is always testing us at how much faith we have, and he did it to Israel. He wanted to make sure they would have the faith to trust in him when it was time to bring them out. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 is an interesting verse here. He says here, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger. God humbled them to suffer them to hunger. Why? Then it says, then he fed them manna after they were hungry. He, now he humbled them to get them hungry, then fed them uh, manna. Why? Which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that ye might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live by. That was the reason. 
God's trying to say, you learn my words, do it my way, and you wait on me, and it will all come together at the right time. Look what God's telling us here. Humbled us, suffered us to hunger, just so he could test. God tested Israel, and they complained that they were good at it. What they should have did was just kept praying and trusting that God's in control. Hey, I've told you this before, but prayer is for us, not for God. Prayer is for us. God already knows the problems before we even pray. We're not surprising him or informing him that we have this problem that we're having. Prayer is for us. How much faith do you have that you're going to continue praying? Just the way George Mueller did. What a lesson there is here that we might make thee known that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word out of God's. When you really start trusting in God, years ago, and I, I said this in the past, it always bothered me. I was always looking, and I've seen the people that were closer to the Lord always have to, had seemed to have more stuff. They were more well off. I don't mean millionaires or anything. It just it was a, a different thing going on there, and and I want well, I'd like to have some of that. I'm going to give you an illustration here in a minute about that. When we have problems, we go to God and we seek what we would uh, what He would have us to do. God made promises to us, and one of them, one of my favorite ones, is Philippians four nineteen. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. All my needs. That's a promise. When we look at God and claim his promises, then we should have the faith uh, that it will come back to us. We just don't know when. And that's where faith goes into. Is it not? We have to wait on God for his timing. You remember the tea kettle? How many here remember the tea kettle where you boil tea and it would whistle when the steam come out? I don't think about this. Although it's up to its neck in hot water, it continues to whistle. We should whistle while waiting for God. And that's what Philippians 4.4 4 says. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. We should be rejoicing even through the worst conditions. Our bodies, problems, our financial problems, our family, whatever. My my son's a good example of that. That just took place. My son, uh, you know, my wife just mentioned that he was down with work and on. Obviously, he wants to pay his bills and all that, and he's doing everything he can to make some side money and all. He moved in, but he needed a refrigerator. Uh, we went looking together, and uh, and uh, we ended up actually buying one from uh, uh, Goodwill. I lost the name. Good. We tried uh, Miracle Hills. We tried banks, and then he tried some other places. It was amazing how many people were selling. I tell you what, selling used refrigerator is big business, but uh, it's amazing. He said, "Dad, you would not believe how expensive they are. The cheapest one was four hundred dollars and on up for used ones, and all." Uh, and he said, "Some of them." He said, "Dad." I just had, to, I wanted to laugh. They were so terrible at all. And yet they were, uh, I don't know if people were buying them. And so we found one. I decided, I let me, let's go out together. So we went out together and we saw one up there. And I said, you know, that's not a bad refrigerator for the price. And, uh, and it came with a warranty. And what I did not know that you don't pay sales tax over there. I guess it's because it's a 5013C. It never occurred to me. And plus they had a warranty with it. And we went to banks. I don't know if you're familiar with banks. They, you can buy stuff for your refrigerator and dishwashers and all that. Well, they sold them. And, uh, and they had some. But, and I told my son, I said, you know, if you add everything together, this is the best deal. So he went back and he, oh, he, he bought it. So anyhow, he, they said they'll, he'll, he'll get a cart. The, the, the uh, freezers and refrigerators they have there, I don't know if it's washing machines too and all, but... They're not donated to them. It's another company that's putting them in there. I didn't know that. They explained that to us. And so the other company has to pick it up and take it to you and set it up. You can't take it from them and set it up yourself. They won't sell it to you. I know, but that's the rule. So my son's getting frustrated really bad about it. And he's, 
He starts really getting mad at them because they won't give it to him until Monday. And he says, man, I, I'm, I, I, got, I loaned him the coolers here and uh, put his stuff in, and he took the freezer stuff near my daughter because it lives just a short, uh, what, a mile away. And uh, so she, he put the frozen stuff there. And so what ended up happening, he really lit into them. And then he called up uh, Goodwill and lit into them. He said, why can't I come and pick it up? I need the refrigerator now. Well, anyhow, I talked to him and I said, son, uh, I said, son, let me know what you're going to do. I said, we'll get the money back, even though they say they can't. I deliberately put it on my credit card. And so we could take this money there because in the credit card, it allows you three months to, you can say, I don't like it or whatever. And the credit card uh, court system, I've been through it when I was in business. It's very, it's usually always to the, the person that charges. They have more leniency, I guess. So uh, we did that. And uh, uh, so I said, I can get it back off if you don't want it. And uh, he says, okay. So the next day I called him. I said, what decision did you make? And, oh, before I did that, when he told me how mad he was, I said, son, I said, I'm going to tell you something. You're a Christian. I said, number one, I think you're not realizing that they may be so busy that they can't deal with everybody at one time. And so maybe that's why it's money. I, I wouldn't think they deliberately just push it off while they're sitting there doing nothing. I said, remember when we were in garage work? We couldn't please everybody all the time. I said, if I were you, what you need to do is call them up and apologize and ask their forgiveness and call the other ones up and say the same thing. I said, God does not want us, uh, wants us to forgive anybody, all, everybody. And uh, that's biblical. And, and he says, he'll hold your prayer back if you don't ask forgiveness of people that have done this wrong. And he felt that they did him wrong. So anyhow, I went ahead and preached at him for a while about going to church regularly every Sunday and all, about growing in the Lord. I, I, I try not to do that anymore, but I did it that day. I gave it to him. He didn't say a word. At some point, I thought he actually hung up. You know how you, when you're talking on a cell phone and you realize later that no one's on the other end? <laughs> and uh, so I said, you're still there? He goes, yeah. So I said, this isn't going over well. I could tell right away. So I finished, I hung up. The next day I said, did you make a decision? Do you, are you getting rid of the refrigerator? I mean, getting it. He said, I'm going to get it, Dad. He says, I called him up and apologized. I went, really? He said, yeah, I even called Goodwill and apologized to them. And uh, he said, when I apologized to the warehouse people to supply it, he said, no one has ever done that before. He says, I want to meet you. I went, see, son? I said, I, I, God has taught me so much about being nice to people all the time. I try to do it when I go to Walmart and all, people that are near the door. I'll wait just for people. Uh, and I've had, you know, people complain about prejudice, you know, on TV, the white people, this and all. I can't tell you how many black people I've had hold doors for me, even old ladies and all, and uh, hold doors for me. And I'm just trying to return the same thing back to everybody else and just be kind to everybody, return the favor. And, uh, and so he learned something valuable about trusting in the Lord and all when I thought he was not listening. And that's the thing that we have to do. See, it's so easy for us to jump at things and react. We need to wait on God and do what God have us to do. And here he changed somebody's life. I want to meet you. And by the way, he did get the refrigerator and they got, got it to him on Saturday. So he got it Saturday. He said, well, if you can't do Saturday, you got to wait to Monday. I, I was wrong. He said, no, we're going to get it to you Saturday. And he got it in. We had to babysit our granddaughter. He couldn't, they were going to deliver, and we had to take her to a, a birthday party in a roller skate ring. Uh, I got to teach my granddaughter how to roller skate. And uh, so we did that, and uh, we got back, and here he had the refrigerator. He was cleaning the stuff out there. He, he was so proud, and that refrigerator was even nicer after he cleaned it up. And not that it was a rag to begin with, but he got a good deal in there. And even my wife was pretty impressed with the refrigerator. And it was 25 cube, was it cubic feet? Or, not cubic feet, cubic inches? Mm -hmm. Cubic feet, okay. Uh, that's a pretty good sized refrigerator, double door. I mean, it was. It even had an ice maker. I said, "You got yourself a great deal." But son, I think that taught you something right there. 
Your forgiveness to them made a huge difference between you and the Lord, and the Lord blessed you. Uh, after a long period of praying, God puts Israel to the test in Egypt, and he wants them to trust. That's all he ever asked them to do, and God does it the same way with us today. I'm going to give you a little illustration about positive outlook that I think you'll enjoy. Do you have a positive outlook about problems? like the guide of a jungle boat cruise on one of the jungle boat rides a certain theme in a certain theme park a nervous lady passenger asked the guide if he ever had trouble with snakes dropping into the boat from overhanging limbs nah he uh, drooled no trouble at all see if you got a snake in the boat then you got the people in the water you got people in the water and you got alligators in the water you got alligators in the water then you got people back in the boat no trouble at all (laughs) but think about what he's saying here there was trouble there but he doesn't worry about it because it always works out that's waiting on the lord oh by the way that was taken from uh treasures of exodus Back in Egypt, at midnight, this is after they get the money, the silence of the night is going to be shattered by parents, grandparents, siblings, and spouses as the firstborn of their families die in this tenth and final plague. Every rebellious Egyptian will have their will be affected whether the place is in the palace, uh, the prison, or the poor side of town. No one will be protected unless God's instructions were followed. As the country, as the countryside would be littered literally with dead firstborn animals and people, God's people will be preparing for departure. He would protect Israel to show this was a judgment from God on the Egyptians. There would be no deaths among the Israelites because, as we shall see, they obeyed God's instruction for the passing over of the death angel. Now what happened? This is what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to sacrifice this animal there. They were supposed to eat all of it up that was edible. Take the blood out. Uh, One of the things God has said, never eat the blood of an animal. And that's with us today. We're not supposed to consume the blood. And he says, because the life is in the blood. What was not edible was supposed to be roasted up in the fire. They were supposed to take the blood that night and put it on the post. Top, bottom, both sides. And if that was there, the death angel would pass over. They obeyed God and he blessed them. We have the same opportunity if we do what he asks us to do. Waiting on God takes faith. It takes patience. And sometimes God puts us to the test to see how far we will go. He did it with Abraham. He let him go all the way to he was 100 years old to have a child. Way past childbearing age of its day. And he does it by waiting to see what we will do. And think about this. I spoke on the prodigal son a while back. The prodigal son tried to do things his way. And for a short time, he literally lived high on the hog until it all came down, tumbling down. He finally got his heart right with God and everything he ever hoped for got better. Job lost everything he had and he didn't do anything wrong. He lost everything, family, his kids, everything but his wife and his wife nagged him about cursing God. His three friends didn't help it matters anyhow. But Job never, never budged. He said, God giveth, God taketh away, blessed be God. And he ended up with more than he ever started with. He got the kids back, got the money back, got everything way above. Why? Because he waited on God. The question is, are we going to wait on God? Or are we going to try to fix things ourselves? Rather and and listen, you can try to fix things, to do a good thing, what you're trying to accomplish, but you're doing it the wrong way because you're not doing it the way God would have you to do it. And that's what we have to learn. 
Wait on God. It's worth it in the long run. Let's pray. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.